Listen in the trial and the change This one Where 
Welcome to Element, for those of you who don't know me. He does that kind of stuff on purpose. He can't convince me otherwise. Anyways, good morning. Welcome to Element. If you don't know who I am, my name is Sarah. I serve as part of the staff team here at Element. 
This morning, I get the opportunity of welcoming you into service, letting you know about some few upcoming events and things like that, as well as other ways for you and your family to get connected while you are here. But before getting into all of that, I'd love to extend a special welcome to anybody who might be new or visiting us for one of the very first times, whether you're here in this room or joining us on our live stream, we'd love a chance to connect with you. If you are on our live stream, the easiest way to say hello is to simply type hello into the chat box, or there is a digital connect card linked to this video. Video, you can fill that out and we can get in touch with you virtually throughout the week. If you're here in this room, there are two cards behind the seat back in front of you, on the seat back in front of you. Uh, one of them tells you a little bit more about who we are, what we believe in, and the other one is for you to fill out. Give us just a little bit of your information so that we can get in touch with you throughout the week and find out better ways that you can um, get connected here at Element. You can leave those cards either in any of the offering boxes on the doors, uh, or you can come through those double doors after service, and I will be at the Welcome Center. I'd love a chance to meet you and receive that from you and possibly answer any questions you you might have. We also like to start every service making sure everyone knows exactly what we're about here at Element and his name is Jesus. Jesus! That's right. We aim to glorify God by teaching and living out the scriptures, transforming community into gospel community, and planting churches. And so hopefully when you think of the people of Element, that is the sort of thing that you think about. Okay. There is a lot happening behind the scenes here at Element right now. A lot of exciting things, a lot of new things. 2023 has given us some fresh ideas, some new people willing to serve in different ways, and we're just really excited to offer a lot more opportunities for each of you to get plugged in. And so one of the new things that we are kicking off this uh, year, this spring, winter, the thing saw its shadow, so we're still in winter. Also, there is a gopher roaming around no, on the... No, Joey, got it. Joey got it. Good job, Joey. We're safe. Okay. Marked safe from gopher. Okay. Anyways, sorry, ID rail. We have something brand new coming up this uh, year, and that is a new men's study. And I'm going to read the description because I want to make sure it's accurate. But um, the goal behind these gatherings of this new men's study is for the men of element to experience God by entering into community with one another, exploring the truth of his word, and expressing their faith to others. So this is going to be kicking off March 4th. That's a Saturday morning. The first session is set for four weeks to try things out and see how it's going um, and then switch studies or something like that. But it's going to be taking place in the barn, which is the big building in the middle of the property uh, in the dirt. It's from 7.30 a.m. till 9 o'clock a.m. on Saturdays. And so you are welcome to bring your breakfast with you or even afterwards grab a couple of the guys from the study and go out to breakfast together and communicate and connect uh, a little bit better that way. So mark your calendars uh, for that if you are interested. And we haven't forgotten about the ladies. Our women's Bible study is also starting to pick back up. They took a break for holidays and winter, but they are going to be restarting on March 1st. And that takes place on Wednesday mornings right here in this room at 9.30 a.m. And this session, they are going to be reading Louis... Giglios? Yes, thank you. Uh, book, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. It's an in-depth study of Psalm 23. It's going to have a book and a study guide, which all can be found on Amazon. Um, and they also offer childcare for those who might need it, but you do have to sign up. So if you're interested in either of those events, please see the links in today's YouVersion app or the um, Church Center app, and you can get signed up to get more updates on that. And the last announcement for today is that our annual blood drive is coming up. This is our fourth time hosting Vitalent, and we like to partner with them once a year and just uh, be an extra place where people can come, donate blood, and, and that all of that stays right here in our community, which is really nice. So the blood drive is taking place on March 18th. You have to have an appointment in order to give, and so you can either come to the Welcome Center and I can help you um, choose one of the appointments, or there's a link as well to that in today's version as well as the Church Center app. So that is all the announcements that I have for you this morning. Now, if you'll please take an opportunity to stand up and say hello to the people around you. Uh, 
I am. No. No, now it's weird if you don't do it. This is, this is not a prop for me this morning, so I'm not going to be like in the middle of the message. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Although, if you were like, wah, you'd be all brothers and sisters. Be, be, be kind of awesome. Be kind of awesome. Uh, and, and going on to what Sarah says about all the things that are taking place. Actually, I'm going to take a step back here. If you don't know this, we have a cat at Element. And I know I make fun of people with cats. I get it. But Joey is amazing. <laughs> and the, there is just this gopher out here in the middle of the flower bed lounging around. And just Joey, boom, and just saunters off with it. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> the poor gopher. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's not how we roll. Uh, okay, so on top of everything Sarah was, was talking about, you know, women's study, men's study, all these things, we are also doing something on March 11th. Is that a Friday night? Saturday. It's a Saturday night. I don't know my dates. Uh, and what we are going to do if you have kids is we are going to watch your kids at night for you so you could have a date night. Uh, I know, okay. I, I keep saying I'm not going to talk about my puppy I got anymore, but uh, my <laughs> wife and I had to go somewhere like a week ago, and I got a puppy sitter. I, I called a babysitter uh, that watches kids at Element, and so I said, hey, how much do you charge to watch kids? Come watch my Babysitting is not cheap. <laughs> I understand this now. So we are going to watch your kids for free, but you have to sign up by March 6th. And Sarah says, I did such a good job last week getting you guys to uh, do the scholarships for the Thailand stuff that she goes, let them know we also need sitters. So if you don't have kids, like, you know, Jim Bray says he's retired, just hangs out a lot, got a lot of free time on his hands. <laughs> If you would like to watch kids, uh, let Sarah know as well, because we, again, it's, it's tough. I get it. I only have a puppy, and I understand how hard this is. Kids, I get, are way more difficult, and it's nice to have a night out. And if you are someone who wants to bless others by watching kids, we would love to do that, unless you're a weirdo, then don't come watch kids. But if you're like a normal, nice person, yes, we'd love to have you watch kids. Is that good, Sarah? Did I get it? Yeah, I'm walking out because you said weirdo. <laughs> I don't know why I say weirdo when she walks out the door, so anyway. <laughs> hey, welcome to Element. If you are new, there are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. Uh, there are sermon notes on the communion tables around the room. They look like this. And on the inside, you'll get a little recap of what we talk about, as well as some questions to talk to your friends or your family, gospel community about. On the back side, you get the verses we're looking at today, and then a place for notes underneath that. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. You click on More and then Events in Uversion. We will come up by GPS in your smart device, and you will get the sermon notes, the verses, the questions, announcements, all that goes with today's message. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? 
And this is Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. And it says this, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Ooh, sounds like fighting words today. Let's pray. Uh, Father, today we ask that you would teach us what it means to live for you, to understand the gospel, and to take it seriously enough that we want to have it in the forefront of our lives, that we want to live out the understanding of what you have done and how you have rescued us, that we would find great joy in what you have done, but we would also be a people who want to live in the truth of that in ways that maybe sometimes has hard conversations, but comes back to a place of where what you have done in the truth of the gospel becomes paramount in how we live our lives. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we are going through the New Testament book of Galatians. This is week seven. If you have an element Bible, you can open to page 631. And someone mentioned after last week when I say an element Bible, they say, can you explain that? Because we did not make our own Bible. Okay, it's it, <laughs> When I say an element Bible, I mean the Bible in the seat back in front of you. When we first started Element, uh, we ordered like 2,000 English Standard Version Bibles. And Crossway was really nice to put a cover on it with our logo on it. So it's not our translation. It's the English Standard Version, a great translation. And so when I say that, it's in the seat backs in front of you. Also, we've given a lot of these to the jails around. So if you ever end up in the Huskow and you ask for a Bible, you might just get an Element Bible. So there you go. All right. Uh, I think Galatians is a good book for us because it hits a lot of the issues that we go through without even necessarily seeing it on the surface of it. And that's why you got to walk through it the way that we do. As time goes on, many times we think we are so much smarter than people who have come before us. Uh, one writer calls it the tyranny of the modern. We just think we're so much smarter than anybody else. And really what you'll see is as we go on, we just find new ways to be dumb. And this happens to a guy named Peter today. Uh, Peter is someone in in the Bible, you think that he's really got things figured out. He's kind of, you know, Jesus reinstates him after he kind of denies Jesus. And there's all these things like, oh, Peter's got it. But again, Peter's just like us. He's a fallen human being and ends up doing dumb things, but he's still redeemed by the grace and the goodness of God. So today in Galatians, we're going to deal with ideas of law and grace and hypocrisy and how it is so easy to fall back into old ways. I was recently reading this thing that Matt Chandler wrote. Matt Chandler is a pastor in Texas, large church, and he was diagnosed with brain cancer a little while ago. He says he, is, he has a seizure, he is rushed to the hospital, and they find a mass in his right frontal lobe. And this is what he says, When I got out of that tube, it wasn't over. The MRI simply showed I had a problem, but the MRI was powerless to actually solve what I identified the problem as being. And so he talks about this, that the difference between hearing the gospel and living in the gospel is really the difference between an MRI and actually the cure for what ails us in our lives. And when we talk about the law in the Bible and the Old Testament, the law is like an MRI. The law is a diagnostic. The law is there to kind of show us in our lives what is wrong because the law is holy and it is good and it is given by God, but it is never meant to heal you or save you. The, the law's job is to come along and say, you've run from God. You have sinned. Our lives are a total mess, but the law can never heal or save us. And it's so important to understand that. Matt Chandler says this, instead of running to and clinging to what heals us, we continually run back and cling to the diagnostic. And we are constantly looking at the law, these things, if I'm just moralistic and do these things, then God will save me. This is how it's supposed to work. No, the law is there to show us our issues. The law is a diagnostic. What Jesus does in the gospel by his death and resurrection, coming and rescuing and saving us, that's what heals us. Too often look at the diagnostic and Jesus comes along and says, no, I want to heal you. Many times people get beaten down because they stare at the law so much rather than focusing on the healing and redeeming work of Christ in the gospel. In Romans 8, 1, we are told, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, the diagnostic says, you are sick. Jesus says, I can heal. So today, you're going to see Paul confront Peter because Peter gets his eyes back onto the diagnostic. He keeps looking back again at the law. He doesn't see in a moment of failure what the gospel has actually done in his life. Our joy is going to flourish when we run to the healer and not the diagnostic. 
If we focus on diagnostic, we're going to focus upon our works. Look how many times I go to church. Look how nice I am. Look how many uh, old ladies I help across the street or wherever that looks like. We're going to focus on the things that we think we're supposed to be doing and not on the one who actually saves us. And there's nothing wrong with doing the right thing. I'm, that's what, I'm not saying that at all. But if our focus is just upon ourselves and our work, it's going to breed a self-centeredness in us, a self-righteousness. And we'll start to judge others around us who are not as self-righteous as we are. Now, some people say what happens in Galatians chapter 2 here is Peter falls into racism. I don't think that's what happens. I think Peter simply has a way of life that was comfortable to him. He got worried about what everybody else was going to think about him, and so he falls back into some old ways. And then Paul will step in to take Peter down a notch, I think in love and in grace, but it's kind of interesting what happens. This is probably one of the most awkward conversations in the early church where people are like, do, 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 do. what are we going to do? What's, what's happening here? So Paul, again, he is looking at the gospel. He wants to fight for what grace is. He has already told the Galatians about going to Jerusalem twice and that the elders in Jerusalem are like, you are preaching the gospel. It is correct. It is true. Right hand of fellowship. We'll go to the Jews. You go to the Gentiles. And so Paul is now continuing his story of what it looks like to truly trust grace. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Cephas, again, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Now, let me give you a little bit of background historically here. Uh, Antioch is almost like a little Rome. It was a place where the Caesars loved. They dumped a lot of money into it. And so really, it's a metropolitan area. They had a large arena for games, uh, one of the largest libraries in the world. Uh, from an ancient perspective, Antioch was a marvel. And if you had a vacation bucket list, that would be on it. You would want to actually go there. So it's a city with a ton of diversity, though. As a matter of fact, historians, Christian, non-Christian, agree that in the Christian church at this time in Antioch, it is split 50-50, Jews and Gentiles coming together. They all love their city. They love one another. And how this is written in the Greek manuscript here is it looks like Paul is getting ready to leave. He's going to go on a missionary journey, maybe to the area of Galatia. We don't really know but he's going to go. And when he gets ready to go, the Jews and the Gentiles, they are eating together. They're doing life together. They have fellowship together. Everything shows that they see themselves on an equal level with one another. So Paul goes. But then when he returns, all of a sudden, they segregated themselves. And you have Jews and Gentiles eating separately from one another. And Paul looks over and he sees Peter in the middle of it. And Paul's like, what in the world is going on here? And maybe you think it's not a big deal that Peter is no longer eating with Gentiles and only eating with Jews. But you have to understand in this culture, in that day and age, this is an issue. In that culture, when you ate at a table together, that is a component of fellowship. It is, we are gathering together. We are equal with one another. We are investing into each other's lives. In our culture, we don't typically set aside large amounts of time to eat meals together, unless it's a holiday, right? We are around speed and convenience. I want to order it through a clown head from a high school kid who sticks it in a microwave and hands it to me really fast and I want it really cheap. That's what we want. Our lives evolve around speed and price, but that's not this culture. This culture built relationships of depth and love around a table. And so dinner is slow and methodic and thought out. And sitting with somebody else and eating with them is not just hanging out. It carried social and cultural implications that don't exist in our culture. And if you read the gospel accounts, Jesus is constantly getting in trouble for this. He is rebuked by the Pharisees for having dinner with the wrong type of people. Uh, Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And that's the operative words there. He eats with them. Again, this doesn't make sense in our churches today when we read this because we typically don't get mad over who's having a meal with whoever unless you wanted to be invited and you weren't and you got FOMO. But, you know, I'm, I go out to lunch with our elders and we're at Rancho Napomo and no one's ever seen us there and say, I can't believe you're having lunch with those guys. I'm out of this church. Well, one guy, but that's a long story. But anyway, um, <laughs> 
I could have lunch, true story, I, I, could, I could have lunch with your worst enemy and you'd be fine with not having to be there as part, because you're probably thinking, oh, Aaron's trying to change them to agree with me. That's probably what you're thinking. See, in this culture though, it was this deep implication of fellowship with one another. Uh, the closest you could probably get today is if you and a friend kind of agree politically and you have another friend who doesn't agree, but that other friend of yours goes to a political rally with these other people, like, oh, how dare you? That's probably Probably the closest maybe you could get. I mean, I don't even know. The table here was friendship and relationship in Paul's culture. Earlier, Peter was willing to sit with the Gentiles. He's willing to eat with them, which probably means he's eating a non-kosher diet. He is walking in the freedom he had found in Christ and not in his dietary historical law. And then these men from James show up, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but Peter's swayed by these men, and he pulls back from this table fellowship with the Gentiles. And many times you got to understand that that Peter is a lot like us because we will do things depending on how people look at us. And Peter, when he takes a step back, it is like he's saying, I am a Jew. I'm supposed to be clean. God calls me to be clean. And those people, well, those people are unclean. And if I'm around them, I'm going to get their uncleanness on me, so I have to get away from them. Now, Peter knows better than this because Peter has actually preached against that. Peter knows that our worth and cleanness comes from Christ alone, comes from what Jesus did, comes from the gospel. But he's being swayed in his heart of how he views others, and it comes out by how he eats and who he eats with at this table. Now, to put your mind at ease, because we went through the book of James last year, these guys most likely were not technically from James. I know it says, for before certain men came from James, that is what they claim. It does not necessarily mean that's the reality. In this day and age, you don't have cell phones. You can't call James and say, hey, this seems kind of fishy. Do you know what's going on? There's no cars. There's no email. So it takes a long time to figure these things out. As a matter of fact, what we do know is in Acts chapter 15, Paul goes to the leaders in Jerusalem again, and he does talk to James, and he says there's people going out and they're running grace into the ground and using your names to do it. And so these people in Jerusalem, they write a letter that goes out. Part of it goes like this, Acts 15, 24. James says, Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words and settled in your minds, although we gave them no instructions. James says, they're not from me. This is not what we're telling people to do. And so what you see here, they may have thought they were from James. They may have thought James is going to agree with me, but James didn't. But again, you got to go back to Peter anyway, because Peter should have known better, just as we all should when we understand the gospel. And I want, you to sh I want to show you why Peter should have known better. And I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. It's on page 597, if you're using one of the Bibles in front of you today. Um, in Acts 10, God does this work in Peter that should have kept his eyes where they needed to be, on Jesus and not on the approval from these men from James. So the problem with these men from James is they see themselves as the most religious because they are focused upon the diagnostic. They're focused upon the law and they, and they take themselves then very seriously and, and that's a problem. I, I don't mean that devout faith in Jesus is a problem, but I mean that many times people who see themselves as the most devout they typically give Christianity a, a bad name. The Jewish Christians here, and they wanted to keep the law, the diagnostic, because for them, it spoke of their purity before God. For centuries, Jews would separate themselves from Gentiles around them, the people who needed God's love the most in order to stay pure. Kind of like if your mom, when you're growing up, she gives you a new set of clothes and says, don't go play in the mud. Don't get it dirty. Well, that's how they felt. Oh, God has cleaned me up. I can't go out and be around dirty people anymore. And that's not really what God ever said. That's not what he said. It's kind of like monks, right? Monks will want to go live quiet lives up, on, up in monasteries to grow closer to God. And yet in so doing, they separate themselves from those who God calls us to, to minister to the most, namely everybody in the world. And a lot of times churches today, we, we do this without even thinking about it. We start to preach against all the things that we're against. Oh, we're against abortion and murder and homosexuality and drunkenness and racism and liberal politics blah, and all that. And it's like a way to try to bring morality to the world and yet we will not engage the world with the gospel like God actually calls us to. 
is preaching morality is not preaching the good news. We have to be a people who engage the world with the good news. So we talk about what we are for. We are for how God brings everybody, is calling people to himself. It doesn't mean you can't talk about morality, but we are first to be a people about Jesus and what he is doing. What is he doing? 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the understanding that God just doesn't come and point out our sin and say, here's all your problems. God actually does something about it to draw us to himself. It's not that God can't have sin around him anywhere. Sin can't be in his presence. So God has to do something about it, which he does in Jesus to bring us to himself. Now, Peter knew this intimately, and this is a little bit long, but I'm going to walk you through Acts chapter 10, because Peter has this vision. God's going to send him on a journey that Peter never thought possible, and all through the book of Acts, God just keeps showing the apostles that the church is bigger than the Jews and Jerusalem. It shows that men and women and the lame and eunuchs and Greeks and even murderers like the apostle Paul can be loved by God and have their lives redeemed. And so God's going to send Peter to this guy named Cornelius, because Cornelius needs some help. Acts 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Now, Rome at this time, if you don't know, they ruled the known world. They were brutal. A lot of times they were very bloodthirsty. And yet, the first Roman you meet in the book of Acts is a solid, blue-collar, stand-up guy, down to earth, and he comes to love the God of the country he is stationed in. He wins the respect, not just of Rome, but his soldiers and the Jewish community around him. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror. Now, I don't know if you ever see this. Today, people are like, oh, I love the angels. I love, every time an angel shows up in the Bible, it's like, ah! And people lose like control of their bowels. They're, they're, they're freaking out. It's, it's like, I, I, you think angels look like precious moments figurines. No, it, they're like awesome. And every time it happens, we are so weird today. Okay. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. So this is how God starts with the Gentile. What does he do with Peter? Go down to verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now the word common there, this is where we get our word profane from, and it means to cross the threshold from something that is unclean to clean or clean to unclean. You cross a threshold. So Peter says, I'm not going to do that. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. Don't call it profane. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Basically, I'll, I'll help you here. God is telling Peter that all the things that have separated him from the rest of the world, dress wise, dietary law wise, what is clean and unclean, is now done away with in the person of Jesus. That's what God is showing Peter. Peter is not fully understanding this yet, but he will. This is more than about food. This is what God is doing in the world by his grace, extending it to all these people. Verse 17. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, because he's processing it. Peter's a slow processor if you read about him in the Bible. Bible. Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. Simon's a tanner. There's all kinds of cultural things. I'm not going to go into that. Verse 18, and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter follows them to Cornelius' house. Verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. As I said, Cornelius has some issues. 
but so does Peter when you see it in the book of Galatians. All right, uh, verse 26. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. And this should tell you, the disciples, the apostles, they're not in this for glory. They're not, oh, look at me. It's like, no, 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 no. None of this comes to me. We worship God. That's who we worship. Verse 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone of another nation. That, that that is a law of the, of the Jews. It's not technically in the Bible that way, but it's something, a personal thing they put on themselves to separate themselves, not a Roman law at all. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Now, do you see what he forgot in Antioch? Do you see, like right here he sees this, God is showing me these things, that there are not unclean people. We are all have all been unclean, and God is the one who rescues and brings us to himself. Verse 30, And Cornelia said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Doesn't say anything about his terror or losing control of his bowels. Okay. <laughs> and said, Cornelius, your, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. Verse 33, So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Do you see that? Do you see what he forgets when you get into the book of Galatians and this thing happens in Antioch? God has crossed the threshold. God has brought all of us who are unclean into his presence by a work that he has done. Verse 33, but for 35, but in every nation, anyone who fears and does what is right is acceptable to him. So Peter now talks about the gospel. Verse 39, in Jesus, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes, that's the word for trust, in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Okay, Peter here is preaching this message to the same people in Antioch he is refusing to eat with. That does not just blow your mind what's taking place right here. Peter in Acts will speak of Jesus' life, death, resurrection from the dead, because that is what cleanses us. That is what gives us right standing before God. Jesus, when he was here, he said to the religious leaders, the temple you have built and the animals you have killed and the blood that you have shed, it is all now unnecessary because it all finds its fulfillment in Jesus. The temple for the Jews was the place where sin was atoned for. That's now in Jesus. The temple for the Jews was the place where people People came and worshiped God. That's now in Jesus. The temple was the place where the priests interceded before God for the people. That is now in Jesus, who is our great high priest. What happens? Cornelius' family and household believes. They are saved. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. Peter is astonished. He praises God for this. Some people believe that in Acts, these are the first full Gentiles to believe. And what you see is that all this time when the church starts going, it's really starting with Jews. And so you had these Jewish Christians. So there's no arguments about circumcision or dietary law or any of this stuff. But now Peter's like, God's doing a bigger work than just the nation of Israel. God's doing a work in the entire world. Like Peter's like, I'm standing still. And God is the one who is moving. Then Peter, verse 46, declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain, then asked him to remain for some days. So Peter stays there, which means he probably eats a non-kosher diet and he has table fellowship with these people. Doesn't that sound great? Okay. Gosh. Let's start from the top. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I got a long way to work here. People are coming to get here. Okay. Um, so, but what happens? So Peter, this is interesting. At the beginning of Acts chapter 11, verse 2. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcision party criticized him saying, listen to this. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. That's the criticism right there. God is breaking through all the dumb barriers that people have set up. 
He's doing a work. Peter sees it clearly. He sees it clearly. And the circumcision party is like, shame, you had bacon. Shame, how dare you eat with those people? See, that's what's happening in Antioch. You see how ingrained into their hearts and minds this idea of table fellowship is. But you also see Peter already fought this fight. Peter fought this fight. Peter, in the book of Acts, sounds a lot like Paul when Paul is talking to Peter. It's crazy. In Acts, Peter will essentially say to these guys criticizing him, Hey, look, the Holy Spirit fell. Dummies? What do you want me to do? Tell God he can't do that? That's a paraphrase. That's not actually how it says it in Acts. But seriously, you've got to ask the question. How does Peter, who already fought this fight, stood in the face of this accusation, fall right back into this broken way of thinking? And you know how? He's human. He is human. That's how. Paul says, Galatians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas, Barnabas, arguably the nicest guy in the Bible, <laughs> Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, publicly, guys, publicly, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Essentially, what he says is, you know we're not saved by our works, and yet you're forcing them to live by the law. We, that's not what we do. And guys, I will tell you, it's a long way to get where I'm going, but this is why we need one another. This is why we need one another in our lives, because so often we tend to just fall back into these old ways of thinking. Peter needs a Paul. He really does. But you know what? I showed you this a couple years ago. We went through the book of Acts. Paul needs people around him because Paul does react poorly sometimes in the book of Acts. And he needs people around him to do the exact same thing. Now, in Christianity, you will hear this word sometimes talked about. It is called accountability. Accountability. And some people misunderstand this word left and right. Some people, it is like, this is all I need to live a godly life. We have this podcast that we did with one of our elders, Mike. Mike hates the word accountability because of how people have misused it. Because he goes, he's like, I don't need you to sit there and tell me all the things I'm doing wrong. Like, that's the diagnostic, right? He goes, I need you to tell me how good God is. And remind me of the gospel. And that's really what accountability should do. Accountability is not us trying to play other people's police officer. The reason Paul does this the way he does in Antioch, and he talks about it, is that Peter was publicly leading some people astray into this diagnostic way of thinking. And Paul's like, I've got to fight for the gospel here. I've got to, and so he does it publicly. But we, most of the time, will do this one on one. We want to understand what people are going through so we can steer them back to the gospel. That's what true accountability is, every time we do it, it has to be with an eye towards the gospel, not just that diagnostic. We are always going to fall short. Real accountability should be something that reminds us of what the gospel does. And this is what Paul really essentially will do throughout the book of Galatians, is talk about what the gospel is. There are a lot of Christians in the world today who are mean and judgmental because they are zealous about the diagnostic. Some people love the idea of hearing the word accountability because they are zealous about the diagnostic, but they're not zealous about the cure. A law-based Christianity will be a life filled with hypocrisy, and accountability will become life-destroying and not life-giving. And so when we step into one another's lives, we do it with a focus upon the gospel. I mean, Paul is like, you know, it's not in line with the gospel, with the truth of the gospel. That's what he's pushing towards. It's not, here's a diagnostic, you're messed up. It's, this isn't in line with what the truth of the gospel is. And so he reminds what the truth of the gospel is. We are people who were common. We are unclean, profane. God steps over to the threshold to bring us back to himself. I once heard a preacher say this to a room of like a thousand people. He says, I'm a firm believer that there is hypocrisy in every heart in this room, including mine. Totally true, because about two years later, he got busted for doing something dumb. But I think it's totally true as well. There is hypocrisy in every heart in this room. And many times we are afraid to look at it because we want to focus so much on the diagnostic and not upon God's grace. Guys, it is true. I think a lot of us many times have this nominal faith when it comes to our pursuit of Jesus. We're not serious about the things of God. We're not serious about what the gospel actually is. Are we, we, sometimes we're not as serious about God being known in the world as God wants himself to be known in the world. And when you look at Barnabas and you look at Peter and these things that happen, it can overwhelm you. It can bring a lot of guilt into your life, but it's not meant to bring guilt because you look throughout the rest of the scriptures and you see that they were still loved by God. They are saved not by their works. 
They are saved because of what God had done and God continues to do in rescuing us. I'll tell you for me personally, on a good day, I will remember the gospel. This is not a humble brag, but I will remember the gospel and I will treat people well. And there are days where I don't and I treat people poorly and I focus on myself and I take all of God's grace and I turn it inward and not outward. Peter is a great example for our lives because you read through the gospel accounts and you will see Peter focused on Jesus. That guy will walk on water. He gets his eyes off Jesus. He will sink in that same water. He's at the last meal with Jesus before Jesus goes to the cross. When his eyes are on Jesus, I will, I will never betray you. I will die for you. I will go anywhere you need me to go. And then he gets his eyes off Jesus and the next morning before a rooster even crows, he has denied Jesus three times. Jesus will rise from the grave. He will go and reinstate Peter. Peter, I want you to be a minister. I want you to feed my sheep. And Peter's like, oh, okay. In the middle of the conversation, Peter goes, what about that guy? And Jesus is like, Peter, we're talking about you right now. You and me, where's your focus? Our focus needs to be on the person of Jesus Christ. Guys, we continually take our eyes off of Jesus so often. And when we do that, I think we fail to see who we truly are as God's children in the world. Sometimes we focus so heavily upon the diagnostic and we do not even realize what the gospel is truly leading us into. Every time we get our eyes off Jesus, I think all the power and authority and weight in our lives when we have our eyes focused upon Jesus vanishes and we start to stumble about. And this is what happened in Antioch with Peter. Takes his eyes off Jesus, takes his eyes off the gospel, and he once again starts to be concerned with the approval of man. The reason why Paul says this to the Galatians in this church is they are getting their eyes off the, off the gospel. And they are starting to care about what these false teachers are saying and not what the gospel actually teaches. Hebrews 12, 2 reminds us, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured this cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Our eyes are meant to be fixed upon Christ. Not only does he save us, he is also sanctifying us, conforming us more to his image every single day. We have to understand the gospel is not just what rescues us. The results of the gospel continues to purify us. Because we should want to invite people into our lives to people you trust, not just any Joe, right? But somebody, somebody into our lives that you trust that maybe when you're drifting, maybe it's in your marriage or maybe you're dating and you're not married. So maybe it's in your dating life or raising kids or money, all the issues with our heart and our soul that can lovingly steer us back to the gospel because we trust one another. So here's my questions for you. Where do you think it's easy for you to forget the gospel and start to drift? Where is it easy for you to get your eyes maybe upon the diagnostic and not on the grace of God? Where do you right now maybe seek people's approval rather than God's acceptance of you, rather than resting in God's acceptance of you? And maybe who can you invite into your life or maybe so you can step into somebody else's life in a way that reminds one another of the gospel? Because I think when you see what happens here, yes, Paul has a holy, righteous anger in what's taking place, but you also see Paul loved and respected Peter. And as a matter of fact, you'll get when Peter writes uh, his couple books, he will actually say, speaking of Paul's writings, that Paul's writings are on par with Scripture. So Peter is not walking around hurt about this. He's like, thank you. Thank you. I totally needed that so I would understand and remember what the gospel is. Paul loved and respected Peter. And that's why he's willing to do this. So who can we be a Paul for? Or who can be a Paul in our own lives? Because you've got to ask one more question in this. If you look at Peter, what do you think is going to ultimately lead Peter to the most joy in his life? Is it going to be trying to please everybody else around him? Or is it going to actually be living in the grace that God has called him to? Living according to the conviction of God's great grace over him. And I don't know if you've ever found yourself trying to pretend for people around you to make them like you. I call that a first date. <laughs> And some, and some people never stop. Yeah, I've seen people, they, they get married and they still got, and it's just exhausting. It is exhausting. Guys, we will never receive real love in a place like that where we just have this mask on us all the time. Real love comes when we understand what God has done for us in the gospel and we live that out. If we have a mask on and people love us, and deep inside you're like, you don't really love me for me. You love me for the mask that I have. And this is why we get to be a people who understand that the gospel sets us free. 
It sets us free to be a people who can live in honesty about our lives, where we've been, where God calls us to. We understand that God is the one who crossed the threshold to bring us back into relationship with him, that God has done all of the work because he is the one who saves. And so when we look around the world, what we need to see is that every single person on this planet was common and unclean, including us. And God crosses the threshold to bring us back to himself through his grace and his goodness. And so, yes, there can be people in this world that you vehemently disagree with about certain social issues. But you also have to understand that we are all in the same boat and we all need a rescue and redemption. And that will help us to be a people who will not just speak about the things that we are against, but we'll talk about what we're for. God's great rescue of us bringing us to himself. Because he is the one who is good. And so today, you know, this is one of the reasons we come to communion every single week. It's a reminder of what God did in rescuing and saving us as a people. So you take that cracker and you break it like Christ's body was broken for us. And you dip it in the wine or the grape juice. Because it reminds us of his blood that was shed for us. Because this is how we become a safe people. I'm going to put my arm around you the whole time, by the way. No? Okay. Sure. You're not common or unclean, Mark. <laughs> Come and take communion and remember that it is God's great love that rescues and saves. And we get to live in that joy that our God has come. And not just pointed out all the places that we failed, but has actually come to us in the place where we are to bring us back to himself. So that's what we remember in communion. Uh, if you need prayer today. If you are someone, maybe you're feeling today like you just have a mask on and you've never been able to be real or true with those around you. And you want someone to pray with you about that. You want to talk to somebody about that. Right across the way, there's a lounge. And there'll be some people over there to pray with you, to talk with you, uh, if, if you need to walk through that. Because we want to be a people who can be open and honest with one another when it comes to things of the gospel. There's offering boxes next to all the doors. We give because God gave so much to us. Giving is simply part of our worship. So you have that opportunity every week. It's a response to God's grace given to us. And I encourage you to grab those sermon notes and take the questions. Ask one another some of those questions. Reflect upon what God is maybe doing in your own heart and life today. Maybe who you could steer back towards the gospel or maybe ask someone into your life to remind you of what the gospel is. You know, daily, hourly, Every minute, because we tend to forget so often. Guys, let's be a people who are willing to step into one another's lives by having the gospel be central in how we think and how we see everything around us. Because our God is good and he rescues us. And maybe one day you will see an angel. And you'll be like, oh, but the angel's job will be to steer you back to the gospel. Because this, this is what God has done to rescue and save us. Let's pray. I'll move over here out of your way. <laughs> It's a weird place for your keyboard. Good game. All right. Father, thank you so much for uh, loving us the way that you do. Because really, there is nothing in us that would draw you to us other than how loving and full of grace that you are. And so I ask that we would understand that in a way that, that humbles us. a way that teaches us to be your ambassadors, your hands and feet to the world around us so that you are lifted up and proclaimed and known throughout the world because of how you have saved your children. God, we freely confess that it is so easy for us to get our eyes off of the good news of our rescue and get our eyes squarely into the realms of the diagnostic, trying to figure out all the problems rather than seeing grace. And so today, teach us to understand that grace to understand it so deeply that we would not call anybody common and that we would have a desire to speak the truth 
of the gospel in all situations. And that you would send people in our own lives to be Pauls to us. And you would show us who we can be a Paul for as well. Because this is the reason you place us in this body called a church. To remind one another of your great grace and your great love given to us. Teach us to live out that calling and honor you in how we do that. We ask this in your son's good name. Amen. So, I'm just going to set this over here. As we drop the curtains, what I want you guys to do, take a moment and ask God right now, what mask maybe you have? Maybe it's a different mask in different situations where you're afraid to really be known for who you are. Like maybe you're, you're super tender, but you don't want people to know how tender your heart is. Or maybe you're not tender at all, but you try and act like you are. Like what, what masks are you wearing right now? And as God begins to reveal that to you, lay that at his feet and ask In that moment, God, just remind me of what the gospel truly means and your great salvation given to me as a gift. And that he would then give you the strength to live in that. So you don't have to be afraid to be who he made you to be. And in that, hopefully we will start to reflect the goodness and the grace of God. The great hope that we have received in the good news of the gospel. Your glory is so 
Father, Creator, you hold this world together. There's no one higher than you. Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty Savior, there's no one higher than you. You are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence. Astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for us is always enough. And there is no one higher than our God. There is no one greater than you. Let our lives forever praise. in wonder you reign with love forever there's no one higher than you your beauty your splendor your glory knows no measure there's no one higher than you you are always with us gracious to Forgive us by your power, we've been set free. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high and surrender. Your grace for us is always enough And there is no one higher than our God There is no one greater than you Let our lives forever praise the glory of your name Cause there is no one higher than
Your grace for us is always enough And there is no one higher than our God There is no one greater than you Let our lives forever praise the glory of your name There is no one higher than you Father, we thank you for loving us, saving us, rescuing us, having us be a people who can actually get a, a glimpse of what it means to have you rescue and save and, and love us. And I ask that that understanding would begin to change how we interact with the world around us in ways that people would see and know the goodness of who you are. That as we look around the world, we would not see others as common, but we would see people as made in your image, who you long to restore to yourself. And so I ask that we would speak about the things that we are for, reconciliation with the loving God who has reconciled us. Have us be excited about that mission and to take great joy in speaking about our own rescue and salvation. Amen. Amen. So may we be a people who begin to live this out in our lives, that we would understand that our great God has rescued us, and he calls us to not separate ourselves like Peter did, but to actually be his ambassadors. We get to be his priests in the world. Peter will actually say this. We are a kingdom of priests. You know what a priest does? A priest, this is technical terms, it's called, it mediates the divine. Meaning a priest will show you who God is by how they live. And so we get to be those people. So let's be a people who show the world who God is because of what he's done in us. And that should relate to how we love one another, but it should also relate to how we speak of the gospel and to our joy. We should be a joy-filled people because we have a God who has saved us when we had run from him. So let's be a people full of joy and grace. And we're going to sing another song. You need to move that mic over. Are you going to stand behind that thing? Notice I moved out of your way this time. I did. Right back to you. <laughs> it's like I can't Sorry. get away from him. He keeps following me. It's like when you're hauling a trailer thing. behind your truck. It's like it's just behind me the whole time. It's this guy. Why don't you guys stand with this boomer song? sunrise the colors of the morning are inside your eyes the world awakens in the light of the day I look up to the sky and say you're beautiful